I am here uh, with Elliot Coleman, uh, who spoke, gave the keynote speech yesterday at the Oxford Real Farming Conference. And I have to say, Elliot, it was possibly the most comprehensive and remarkable um, overview of the history of the organic movement that I've ever heard live. I've read some stuff, but I've never heard anybody describe the great sweep of history that your life has spanned in the way that you did yesterday afternoon. And I think that everybody who was uh, uh, at that event at the Town Hall, which can be watched on YouTube, by the way, uh, felt the same way. So thank you very much for that. And thank you, Patrick, coming from you, that's high praise. As you know, and I reminded you yesterday, you uh, were part of the history of our movement, our modern movement, because you sort of stopped uh, at the end of the 70s. And of course, you know, people like me, I'm, I'm a latecomer to this. I didn't really get going until the mid 70s. But we did have you at our Sirencester conference in uh, 1982. I remember it well. And you were the keynote and you inspired us all then. I wanted to ask you about, because you, you traced all the sort of DNA of the emergent early organic movement and you did refer quite a lot to the UK element uh, contribution to that so I'd like to ask you um, what you think the UK the influences and the ideas of the British people in the emergent organic movement how strong were they and how important were they? Oh it, it decidedly important when I first came over uh, to visit uh, uh, farms in England. There were still wonderful people around, like Mary Langman, who went all the way back to the Peckham experiment. Dear friend of mine. Yeah, dear friend of mine, a wonderful woman. You know, and we got to visit farms like uh, Sam Mayall's place. I remember when we were driving up to it in the distance, I saw these fields that looked greener than anywhere around. And I said, that must be where we're going, and it was. It was yeah. There were so many examples of how well farming can be done. And the fact that Faber and Faber was willing to publish all the books that these people were writing for so many years there. Uh, they were, I refer to, I have a library at home with all of them on a long shelf, and I refer to that library as my grandparents, because my grandparents were out of agriculture long before I got interested, but those books and the people who wrote them, uh, they're still communicating with me after all those years. Well, it's amazing to me that uh, you knew a lot of these people and conversed with them and visited them before I got involved at all. I mean, you, you knew um, Lady Balfour, didn't you? And another delightful human being. Yeah. Tell me about your relationship with her. What contact did you have with well, her? Well, I first met her at a conference in Switzerland, uh, uh, an iPhone conference in, in 76, and I had brought a group of Americans over because I had first been here in 74 and been impressed with, at that point, the fact that the Europeans were way ahead of America as far as understanding uh, how to do organic farming better. And uh, so I rounded up 27 Americans and three Volkswagen buses and we drove all over the continent and, and then across the channel to here. And included in that was this conference in, uh, in Sisak, Switzerland. And Lady Eve gave just the most marvelous talk and made points that I had always felt were important, like suggesting that maybe biological agriculture was a better word than organic, because organic was merely one of the ingredients, but biological described the whole process that was going on and where the energy was coming from. She was incredibly in, intuitive about uh, the whole uh, concept of organic farming. But just the fact that her book, uh, first published, what was that, 1942, yeah. was one of the first books on anything to do with organic that actually had uh, scientific citations in the, in the end notes. I mean, that was the first stage to say, hey, we're not just a bunch of odd farmers with strange ideas, but uh, there is something serious behind this that all agriculture should look at. And uh, what did your uh, American colleagues think of her when they encountered her? 
Oh, they they loved her. In fact, uh, they uh, uh, one of them made this delightful comment after we'd been at a pub and, and the, some of the British people come and joined us and sat around the table uh, after listening to Lady Eve uh, talk and you know, encyclopedic knowledge about organic farming, this old leftist turned to me and he said, my golly, he said, if that's the aristocracy, I think there should be more of them, <laughs> which was just a great comment. Well, I, I got involved with the Soil Association when she was still uh, honorary president. So the first few council meetings that I went to in London, mostly at the Farmers Club, she was present. And then there was a bit of a, what was referred to by some of the council as a coup, and the Young Turks, of which I was one, took over. But uh, Lady Eve was slightly conflicted about whether she thought that this bunch of hippies were really dangerous or yeah. actually, you know, a kind of um, dis descendants of what she introduced in the first place. But that's an interesting point in its own right, isn't it, that there's a discussion about how the new organic movement, of which I've been part, uh, related to the founders. Yes, I think probably the point that disturbed some of the old guard then was that the new young farmers uh, were not independently wealthy and were seriously worried about earning a living at this. And so uh, using the, uh, uh, the organic uh, terminology and certification for marketing was a very important thing to them. And uh, that was sort of bringing a new commercial concept into it. It's interesting you should say that, because that was exactly the language that was used by the council about people like myself and Peter yeah. Seger. We were accused of wanting to commercialize the organic market when they saw it as something which is above commerce. And we said, look, you know, um, we sign up to the principles and the philosophy, but we want to make it flesh in the marketplace, because after all, unless people are buying the food, um, it can't go mainstream. But there, that led to a, um, a long chapter of the history of the organic movement, of which we've both been part, namely the development of the standards and the organic market. And I would say that, with the benefit of hindsight, in developing a separate market for food produced in a certain way, we were, in, to a degree, treating the symptom not the cause of the problem, the cause being that we were, the dominant system didn't take account of the balance sheet of nature uh, that intensive farming was degrading. Um, but I want to come back to that. Before okay. I do, I want to ask you about what you thought about the influence of Sir Albert Howard. Well, uh, as far as uh, the US went, uh, Sir Albert Howard was the one who inspired uh, J.I. Rodale, who started Organic Gardening magazine. And uh, he actually, uh, Rodale, uh, talked uh, Sir Albert Howard into being a, a co-editor and, and writing articles for it. Um, although it's interesting that because of that magazine, I think that uh, adds to some of the confusion in the U.S. because all of the first interest was for organic gardening, not organic farming. And the trouble with that is that organic gardeners are looking at it from, oh, okay, I'm not going to use superphosphate, I'm going to uh, use bone meal. And it became understood in the US that the whole concept behind this was substituting natural fertilizers for chemical fertilizers, where actually the whole idea behind it is substituting green manures, cover crops, scrap rotation, mixed livestock for a system of farming that was ignoring all of those management practices in favor of buying in chemicals. And so there is a group in the US, uh, uh, OMRI, the Organic Materials Research Institute, that it pronounces whether something is allowable for using in organic farming. But even though we're vegetable growers and should be thinking in those terms, we realized years ago that the key to this was a system realignment. And our system realignment is to run basically a lay farming system with our laying hens grazing the pasture and the land then becomes vegetable land the following year. And we're running basically a no input 
farm because and, and, you know, the number of studies that talk about what green manures you grow and how effective they are deeply rooting and bringing up minerals from down below, which, I mean, the fertility is there forever and ever if the soil is managed with uh, thoughtful biological practices. Sir Robert was an important influence on well, he was uh, behind the formation of the Rodale Institute, or one of the major influences on th that organization, but something got slightly lost in translation. And maybe the same could be said for um, the development of the organic movement here. It's been seen very widely as a niche market for people who could afford more expensive food, and not something that real farmers who are dealing with, grappling with the issues of the day would necessarily adopt and we've, I think to a degree, I've been part of that ghettoization process, not intendedly, but you know, it's how things go. But now, of course, we've got to a very different stage where, as we heard from Michael Gove yesterday, um, if you believe he, what he said, um, and it's uh, converted into policy, we could be beginning to create the conditions for uh, the wider scale adoption of more sustainable practices based on organic principles. Do you think that's needed and do you think it's possible? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there, is a, a, there are a, a bunch of farmers in the U.S., uh, large farmers out in the Midwest who would normally never even know how to spell organic or not want to, who have discovered all of a sudden green manures, cover crops, crop rotation. And one of the leaders in this is a, a, a gentleman named Gabe Brown, and he's written a book, uh, Dirt to Soil. And uh, I've run into a lot of them at conferences, and uh, the thing I always tell them is they are doing more than a bunch of vegetable growers ever could because the large farmers out there think we are a niche and uh, a, a funny niche, but all of a sudden they're discovering, my gosh, this is saving us money. My gosh, the crops are better. Uh, my gosh, look at all this. And, uh, and their eyes are being opened. And what fascinates me is their eyes are being opened to ideas that have been presented by scientific agriculture starting in the early part of, of the 20th century. And yet the chemical industry was so effective at pretending those ideas didn't exist and keeping people from thinking that way. And one of the best books around is a book uh, that was written back in 1911 on permanent agriculture. And uh, the man who wrote it was the head of one of the uh, university uh, uh, research farms in the US. And he's telling farmers that if they grow clover, uh, they're going to be taking free nitrogen from the 70,000 tons of each acre of their farm, and why are they buying it? Well, no university any from the 40s on would ever have said anything like that because their minds had been co-opted. But the information was there, the concepts were there. Yeah. And this is what is being rediscovered by Gabe Brown and, and the large farmers. And to me, that's absolutely fascinating to see. And even if they never utter the word organic or agroecology, you can see that the ideas they're following are on the same vein. Yes, that's very exciting. And uh, I think this is happening all over the world at the moment. Yes. Yeah. In a way which you couldn't expect. It's rather like the hippie time. You couldn't exactly explain why there's this shift of consciousness which took place and arose all over the place, but it did. And I think something related to that is happening again now, which is very exciting. Absolutely. But yeah. I wanted to also explore, because I would describe you as the elder of the North American organic horticultural movement, uh, if not the patriarch. Um, and we have, a, we have a man who's not so widely known here, Peter Seger, who I would describe as the equivalent. You know him. Oh, I know Peter well from when I came and over before, yes. He and Tolly, he and Tolhurst, yes. are arguably yes. the two that are the leaders in that area. Now, Tolly, as you will know, is, is um, inclined towards veganism. Um, uh, but the, the kind of system that you've described that you are practicing in Maine 
um, and the systems that I'm using do involve livestock. And I would be interested to hear your thoughts about the role of sustainably managed livestock in horticultural systems and indeed in organic agriculture as a whole. Yes, uh, livestock are indispensable for uh, soil fertility. And uh, one of the favorite books on my shelf is Lay Farming by Sir George Stapleton. And in there, he just explains that a sod is basically a compost waiting to be used because of the, enormal, the enormous amount of uh, organic matter stored in there. And that the reason you have it is to provide uh, the best possible food for grazing animals. Uh, we don't have enough acreage uh, to have four-legged grazers. And uh, eggs are an excellent product to go along with vegetables in the markets we sell to. So we have chickens out there grazing. But they make very good use of it, and they add their manure to it the same way four-legged uh, grazers do. And I look upon that as the only truly sustainable over the long term system because on the years it's in uh, grass uh, and clover, you're building fertility. After you've turned that under, you're, you're exploiting what you created, and then you're creating it again. And this is a perpetual system. And without livestock, you could certainly have the uh, grass clover pastures, but you'd sort of be saying, well, gee, why? Why don't we create more food? And where I live in, in New England, there are so many rocky and hilly uh, pastures that are providing all sorts of milk and meat that you could never uh, till up or, or plant crops on. I wanted also to ask you about your comments yesterday relating to the takeover by the government of the organic standards. And I was part of a parallel process here. In fact, the Organic Growers Association and the organization that I was running at the time, British Organic Farmers, had a big and very heated debate when the UK government first introduced organic standards, which was in 1987. We had a meeting at the Soil Association offices where there were two camps, and the camp that I was in narrowly won, which was we must collaborate with the government. We can't just keep outside of the tent because if we want mainstream adoption of organic farming practices. The government in some way has to be involved. So what do you think about that decision, and what is the US parallel, and where are we now? Right. When I first went to Europe, uh, there were three or four or five different certification bodies because there were a bunch of different philosophies of approach to organic farming over there. And I thought that was utterly fascinating. There was even a Swiss supermarket, Migros, that had a, a separate area in their produce department called Migrosano. And they had found which pesticides the Swiss consumers were uh, most worried about. And they had contracted with farmers to grow with, without that. And this was neat. So you had the biodynamic was probably the purest at one end and maybe Rosano at the other end. But it gave the customers a range of choices as to how much they wanted to pay for how much purity. And I thought it was a wonderful system. And when the uh, US groups, uh, I always avoid bureaucrats at all costs, started talking to the government about the, the present situation. I had a number of discussions with them explaining to them that it was a mistake to define organic in that way because I guaranteed you that large producers would uh, have drinks with the Secretary of Agriculture and the standards would just drop like that. Uh, which is what's happened. Which is what's happened. Uh, and the phrase is market facilitation. And it makes no sense to go after a standard and then chop away at it so by the time you're finished, you have nothing. And that's what has been happening in the, in the US. Uh, the US Department of Agriculture has totally sold out to the large scale uh, marketers. And these people bring a lot of political pressure and uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, donations to, uh, to politicians when they're running for office. And it's just, I mean, right now, uh, hydroponic uh, produce is sold in the US as organic, and there's absolutely no way we've been able to stop that. 
uh, small dairy farms, the type of dairy farm you run, are going out of business at an incredible rate because the Department of Agriculture is not enforcing the uh, law that says uh, dairy cows have to graze for a certain part of the year because it, it's small farms being put out of business by large confined animal feeding operations with 20,000 cows in one operation. You can imagine it's a little hard to send 20,000 out to the pasture. Obviously, they don't even think about this. No, I completely agree. I think the, the maximum size of a dairy farm should be related to the capacity of the herd to water grass twice a day exactly. during the grazing yeah. season. And the, the grass makes a higher quality milk and there's all sorts of scientific data on, on that too. That's all related to the question that I challenged you with yesterday afternoon. I suggested to you that wasn't it inevitable that if you uh, try to fix a standard, this is organic, um, above the line is not is good and below the line is bad, you will inevitably uh, create a debate where one group of people talk about the Ayatollahs at the Soil Association who have higher standards than the government minimum, and the other group say uh, standards are being diluted for the reasons you've just described, and isn't the fault, or wasn't the fault, with those of us including myself, who said we have to fix a standard for market purposes, which then becomes crystallised and the subject of debate with um, critics on both sides, which just leads to a kind of polarisation of the farming community. And my suggestion, which is what we are trying to advocate now with the Sustainable Food Trust, and I actually had a conversation with Michael Gove in this room yesterday, is that if we had an audit, an annual audit, which captured all the elements of sustainability of your operation, soil, um, plant husbandry, uh, nutrient cycling, um, emissions, everything, biodiversity, and then that audit formed the basis of an assessment of different certification schemes, exactly as you described for the Migros. Uh, operation. That way we'd move away from this uh, very um, antagonistic discussion about whether um, you could ever accept uh, plants, say, from uh, hydroponic farming. You'd just say, well, it's hydroponic. You don't have to make a, you don't have to yes. get angry about it. you say, well, that's hydroponic. It's not soil-based. Yes. Whereas if you get into the argument about organic, although I completely agree with you, of course, uh, uh, certainly an organic standard ought to be entirely soil-based, I think we have to find a new way of including the people who are on the journey towards more sustainability and more sustainable practices rather than say they're bad because they don't meet the organic standard. Now, do you think there's an equivalent discussion going on in the United States and could it lead to something good? Um, yeah, the discussion in the United States unfortunately has been shut down by the fact that the U.S. Department of Agriculture it just has control of all of it. And when wow. they put in uh, the regulations, they actually say in there that no one can claim to be certifying to a higher standard. Wow. Well, you can imagine how the automobile industry would react if Volvo was told they couldn't say they were better than Ford. And that is what creates competition, which capitalism should love. But in this case, they didn't want competition. They wanted to have this uh, one-size-fits-all label, and it's a real mistake. Uh, there should be groups like uh, there were in Europe when I first went there who say, no, we do this, and this is making better food, and Dr. So-and-so has data, and let the customers decide what exactly. they want. Exactly. Well, it's interesting. We had the Pasture-Fed Livestock Association. Yes. You have the equivalent in yes. North America yes. here yesterday. Yes. And Fidelity, who was around the table with the Secretary of State, was making the case for grass-fed beef and lamb. Um, but it seems to me that if that's what people want to buy, uh, they need that information. But they also might want some information about the, the, the use of chemicals, for instance, or the other practices. And if we could somehow have um, a common way of assessing sustainability and then allow the biodiversity of different labels to flourish or wither in the marketplace depending on what people want, that would be a healthier way to encourage a shift towards more sustainable farming than have these rather narrow debates. Oh yeah, no, I, I agree with, with what you're trying to do there. I think that would be a, a great step forward. 
But how could that happen in the United States? Because from what you describe, you're in rather a bad place. I realize the Trump administration may not be helping things, but that, in fact, that didn't happen during the Trump administration, did it? No, it actually, uh, all this started under Obama. His uh, Secretary of Agriculture was definitely uh, uh, not in favor of anything that wasn't uh, uh, conventional and, and chemical, and it all began then. Um, these are really difficult things because those of us who've been doing this for a long time have seen how successful we can be, just mind-blowingly successful. Farming without all of the chemicals that we were told years ago were absolutely indispensable. They aren't. And so once you see how successful farmers can be using just natural techniques and intelligent management practices, it's just breaks your heart to, to see that the, this almost uh, fall back to, uh, to previous thinking, with, uh, ignoring completely the fact that uh, there have been farmers successfully doing this uh, without any problem for all these years. And the, the hydroponic thing, uh, these people know that the customers aren't flocking to the store to buy hydroponic. That's why they don't put their name on it. Uh, you know, we proudly put our, our name, our farm name on everything because our farm has a reputation for good quality produce. So uh, this is just, it, it's devious. It's, uh, it's an example of, uh, of business practices at their worst. And we'll keep fighting. Who knows? We will prevail in time, I hope. Well, uh, long may this collaboration between uh, our two countries absolutely uh, be uh, encouraged and perpetuated because I think that we both uh, feel part of something which is bigger than any of us and you have been the most enormous influence not only on the uh, you just met one of them just outside this room on the way in on the emergent new generation of organic growers but also on the whole way in which the organic movement in this country has developed and I think that uh, collaboration between us and shared thinking and shared ideas has been at the very heart of that. So thank you for coming over here and giving well, such an inspirational and I thank all of the early progenitors of the ideas in the UK for all that I learned from them, which definitely patterned my approach to farming. Well, bless you. <laughs> thank you, Patrick.